Hi everyone. Welcome to the second round of Maternal Minds. This is where um, I interview women or really talk with them about what parenting is like through the lens of maternal mental health. So now that we're at round two, instead of focusing on OCD, we're going to broaden the spectrum a little bit to include a wider range of mental health conditions. Today, I'm talking to Katherine Mousley, and she is behind the Instagram Maternal Mental Health Project. How are you, Catherine? Oh, very well. I'm good. Thank you very much for asking. Um, just to start, in case people don't know what the Maternal Mental Health Project is, can you share a little bit about it? Um, so I started the Maternal Mental Health Project shortly before a documentary about motherhood and mental illness aired in the UK last year. Um, it was basically, I guess, all things maternal mental health, it was a bit of a project because I wanted to bring all women together who'd suffered from, I guess, baby loss, um, PND, was postnatal depression, yeah. um, any kinds of mental illness, mothers that had been hospitalised, mothers that had mild form of it as well. Um, I, it was so much stigma surrounding it, and I think a lot of mothers were suffering in silence, especially myself. Um, yeah. So when I was going through this, I couldn't, I was scoring the internet looking for people who'd been telling a similar story, um, and I didn't find anyone at all. Maybe I wasn't looking hard enough, but mm -hmm. I just didn't find anything that really spoke to me. Um, yeah. And I had a lot, of, lot to say about all my experiences, so I started the Instagram um, account, and it's taken off quite well, actually. <laughs> Yeah, that's really great. I think you have like, how many followers are there? Uh, four and a half thousand, which is probably quite low now compared to some people on Instagram. But yeah, it's really good though, especially for something that's like as grassroots as this. Yeah. Um, and what made you want to start the maternal health, maternal mental health project? Was it because was it like after your own experiences? Um, yeah, I wanted to help others. Um, when I was going through my experience of baby loss, it was quite an underground world, I felt, of mothers who were grieving. They didn't feel like they could say how they really fit, felt. Um, they didn't feel like they could be open about the way they lost their child. So mm -hmm. I wanted to talk about that quite openly. I also wanted to try and remove some of the stigma, which is, I love stigma bashing. That's yeah. one of my favorite things to do, is just talk so honestly that it just makes other mothers want to tell their own stories. Um, I do think once people start to speak about how they really feel, it kind of lifts the weight off their shoulders. Mm -hmm. So that was my aim to be a, perhaps one of the first people just to be honest about things. And I think that would just paves the way for other people. This opens up a lot of avenues. Yeah, I really think so too. So um, I saw on your Instagram page, so you suffered a baby loss, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, can you share more about that? Okay, so it's probably quite a controversial topic, but I was pregnant three years ago now, and halfway through the pregnancy, we had a diagnosis or two diagnoses. They weren't fatal, but they were quite life limiting. Um, mm -hmm. and all the this uh, diagnosis on a quite a big spectrum, so no one could ultimately say. However, when he was born, he he'd behave a certain way or be a certain way. Um, but his prognosis was pretty poor from what they could see um, on ultrasounds and things. So we made the decision to end the pregnancy um, and I had to go in and give birth to him. So in the UK, it's called a termination for medical reasons. Yeah. So it's quite, I get not everyone really agrees with it either, but I feel like I have fought to stand up for women who have gone through the same issues because it's not all like cut and dry once you've made the decision to end the pregnancy. It, it is such a complex, range of emotions and thoughts and feelings and grief so much grief um and you know you're constantly wrestling with wanting the best life for your child you know versus ending the pregnancy and it's i think it's such a difficult thing to go through and the fact that i guess it wasn't a fatal condition maybe it would been easy if it was but mm -hmm. we were told that he might not live for very long once he was born um, and he might have a life of operations he, he might have a life of pain of suffering as well so yeah. In my heart, I don't think anyone would ever want that for their own child. So, no, I mean, and that's such a hard decision, I think. Yeah. So, I mean, you're really brave, I think, for even having to make that decision and then for sharing about it. Because I've read um, 
Like there's been a couple articles in the mainstream media about women who have chosen to terminate their pregnancies because of something similar. And I noticed there is a lot of stigma around it and there's lots of uh, really harsh judgments that are being made. Lots so. of judgment. I mean, I it's not a decision that's taken lightheartedly at all. We, we went over it for weeks and weeks before we decided what we were going to do. Um, and it's not just his life, it's our future any future children we have, you know, a lot of things rest on this. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I've had a lot of quite online abuse from the decision I made and I still, it still hurts, but I do, I do feel strong enough now to stand up for the decision I made as well. Thank and you. I think, sorry. No, I think that's really, really amazing. And it's really powerful what you're doing just because it's such a heavy topic and, as a mom myself, you know, I've, I haven't suffered baby loss, but I can just imagine how hard it is to make such a decision like that and then to have to explain yourself. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people, I guess, who do have miscarriages or stillbirth, some of the, the why it happened is quite unexplained. Like no one can ever say, no, it happened because of this reason or anything like that. So, but mm -hmm. we know why this happened. We know what we did as well. Yeah. So did you, after you guys decided to terminate the pregnancy, you said there was a lot of grief. Did you have, did you suffer any depression or anxiety because of it? Um, I think afterwards you're quite numb. You have, it took me weeks to get used to what was happening, how I felt. You know, did we do the right thing? Am I a bad person? Going over and over and over all those things. Um, Sorry, so have a lip drink. Yeah, no worries. Um, so I think life didn't really go back to normal and start until I started to go back to work. Mm -hmm. um, until we started to socialise again. I think that's when the grief hits you the most. It yeah. just comes in waves like constantly. I think I guess there was a little bit of depression. I, there's quite a few people close to me who got pregnant again quite quickly. Um, I took that very badly. That was very difficult to handle. So, what like do you <laughs> them or hard to be happy for them or did you just I think it was I mean I was obviously happy for them because some of the people I knew had also suffered a loss as well I think it was just difficult to process that that wasn't me that mm -hmm. I was pregnant again um it was just I think it was just the grief of I mean it happened so quickly from me finding out I was pregnant to then having a scan to then having a diagnosis. It was just over a space of weeks. Um, so you see, you, literally your mind doesn't catch up with what's actually happening to your body. For like sure. It. So yeah. some women, um, because you were pregnant and how many weeks again, can you remind me? Uh, it was 17. 17 weeks. So that's enough for a lot of the hormones to set in. When you, um, when the pregnancy was done, did you do you think you still had to deal with any like baby blues or any of those hormone shifts that happen? Oh, definitely. Um, so I was induced, and I was able to have morphine because he wasn't alive, which I refused because I felt this need to be punished, which still makes me quite sad for that woman. Yeah. Um, and then we we kind of left the hospital empty-handed the next day and you know i could still feel my body going but where's my baby um yeah we went to kind of a ranger's funeral and it's you know you, you've got all the the after physical effects of having a child mm -hmm. you've still got to deal with um but you don't have a baby to show for it which is quite difficult to deal with as well Can't um, um let's see Sorry, I feel like that's just so much to process. Mm -hmm. um, I'm so used to talking about it now that I think I just kind of like rattle it off. But um, yeah, it become quite heavy for someone who's never heard of it before. Yeah, well, because I, I mean, I've had friends who have um, like suffered late term miscarriages and stuff. So they've mm -hmm. been through all the afterbirth and stuff like that. But I always feel like it's such a sensitive topic and yeah. which is why I'm so glad to have you on here and sharing about it just because I know that it's not uncommon. Um, oh, God, yes. I mean, I think so many people feel the need to keep it behind closed doors, um, to not say anything. I mean, every year now I make an effort to celebrate his birthday by baking my cake, mm -hmm. you know, have a nice birthday dinner. 
and um, we blow out candles we have party hats on and that's something that I've noticed since I've started doing that a lot of other people have lost babies also do the same thing so that's I think that's showing someone that you can acknowledge your child that you've lost in a nice way and still keep them part of the family as well and that's really important too yeah. So when you had, how long after your pregnancy loss did you have your child that you have now? Um, so I conceived again four months later, um, oh, almost, oh, almost instantly. <laughs> yeah, it's really quick after. Yeah. How was your pregnancy during that month? Um, very, I mean, like, physically it was absolutely fine. We had a, a scare quite early on. I was mm-hmm. having quite a test done which didn't really help my anxiety. Yeah, um, sure. Mentally, it was pretty horrific. I was just a constant wreck. I was constantly crying. I was, we booked in for scan, we paid for scans every two weeks because um, I was just convinced there was something wrong with him. And I think once you know what can go wrong during a pregnancy, it does mm-hmm. a whole world of you know, anxious thoughts. And even when you're past like certain dates or, um, enter another trimester or something like that you just think oh I'm on the safe side but that never happened with me because I just thought you know every week I knew someone who something had gone wrong at every stage um, so yeah I was signed up to a perinatal mental health service quite early on um, to deal with all the anxiety and I got induced um, earlier due to my anxiety as well with Jake. Oh. Did you go on medication for your anxiety? Um, I didn't know when I actually suggested that, which I think probably could have helped in hindsight, actually. Um, yeah. So I had a very good consultant and we have like a triage um, monitoring for pregnant women in the last three months where you can just go and you can get, you listen to the baby's heartbeat, you can make sure they're moving around okay. So I was in, in there twice a week towards the end, just getting monitored, even though there's nothing like, actually wrong with him at all. By your own accord or was it recommended to check every week? Sorry, I missed that because it cut out a little bit. So did you check every, like, did you check all that time just because you wanted to or because it was recommended by the doctor? Just because I wanted to. Because I was so anxious, I was convinced there was something wrong with him that he wasn't going to make it or if he wasn't, he didn't move for half an hour, I was convinced that was it. You know, he wasn't going to make it to the birth. Um, I had um, an interior placenta as well, so with that being at the front, I just didn't feel him move for about 33 weeks. So that was another thing that added to the anxiety as well. Yeah. So I know that on your um, Instagram, underneath your handle, it says parenting with BPD, that's borderline personality disorder. Yeah. and um, eating disorders also, right, you mentioned? Yes, and well, there's a new one, which is PMDD. Oh, do you have that? Um, I haven't been officially diagnosed, but it's been, due to COVID, I haven't been able to see anyone, but it's been mentioned by a doctor that they think that's definitely it. Yes. PMDD. So for anyone in the audience who doesn't know what PMDD is, it's premenstrual dysphoric disorder. And mm-hmm. it's categorized by like super intense mood swings. Um, you can get like depression during a, speci- a specific time of the month. Uh, Interesting so- ovulation, and I think. Yeah. So when your I hormones think- were the progesterone and estrogen like crossover, that's usually yeah. when you're it's a between ovulation and right before. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so usually um, your progesterone rises and your estrogen falls, I think it is, and it's that crossover about five days maybe during ovulation. Um, and then they usually, as the progesterone it stays level, if you're quite sensitive to that, you'll have a really pretty awful two weeks up until your period arrives. Um, and then it'll suddenly feel magically better. <laughs> it's like happens within a day, right? Yeah, yeah. It's pretty intense every month. <laughs> Um, so I'm, I didn't even know about that, but now I find that really interesting because, um, that is like a clinical, uh, diagnosis, PMDD. So can we talk more a little bit about that and how, when you first started, uh, noticing symptoms and what was the difference between like, okay, these are the mood swings that I may be used to, um, and then, or something different. 
Yeah, sure. It's fine. Um, so with the BPD, when I was in a mother and baby unit shortly after Jake's birth, um, I got diagnosed with that, I think mostly due to irrational behaviour, um, intense suicidal thoughts. Um, I had a couple of attempts while I was in there. And when they did tell me that and I read about it, I did think, oh, my God, this is it. Like, this is something that explains everything that's gone on in my entire life. Yeah. Um, so eating disorders usually go hand in hand with BPD. And then it wasn't until lockdown, actually, when I'd experienced a real awful months of just, I, I was bedridden, I had muscle pain, fatigue, bloating, suicidal thoughts. I was just, I couldn't even think about how to get out of the bedroom. It was just pretty horrific. Um, it wasn't until the following month that the same thing happened again, that I made a connection, that it was something to do with my cycle. Um, I'm quite lucky because I have like a period tracker app thing and I'd gone back through everything and it all correlated with the population. So that was quite a revelation, really. Um, and once I explained it to the doctor, I mean, they go down the medical route straight away of like pills and all sorts of tablets and things to try to fix it. Uh, whereas I think I'm more the holistic approach about trying to get enough exercise and eat well, um, enough sleep, plan around ovulation, make sure you've got plans you can cancel. Um, positive psychology as well is another one. So it's, it's, it's not for everyone that approach, but I think it works pretty well for me. Um, so uh, can you explain more about positive psychology? I think, I was talking about this the other day actually, to someone else. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's mainly about planning around your ovulation dates, making sure that you've got space, making sure you've got time out, you don't have to do anything. You're, if you've got children, obviously your partner can look after them. Um, mm -hmm. You know, tell yourself you can have a day off, it's time to just watch TV, um, get some ice cream if you want to. It's okay to have three or four days in bed is absolutely fine because you know once this passes you'll be able to get up and do everything you were doing before um it's just about telling yourself you know you can get through it writing anything that really helps I guess mentally some people have different coping mechanisms um mainly I think it is just planning and using all your tools that you've got to help your mental health I love that and has it been helping since you've yeah had the last couple of months have actually been, compared to the last few months before that, have been pretty good, actually. I've not had hardly any symptoms at all. Um, when I speak to my partner, we're like, well, you know, we need to take these five days and make them as kind to me as possible, basically. Yeah. Sorry about that ping. That was. Um, I'm going to open my computer one second. I'll be right back. <coughs> Can you talk about when did you get diagnosed with borderline personality disorder? Um, so it was about when Jake was about six months old. And um, we were quite, I think in the UK, we have like mother and baby units where you can, not the noise again. Um, so you, yeah, where you go into hospital with your baby, you get to stay with them. Um, so you're not separated and you, you still have that connection with them as well. I'm not sure they have them in America, maybe. Um, so we, got admitted to a mother and baby unit and there was quite a large pattern of really irrational and quite unstable behaviour. Um, so they diagnosed it there, which was quite a relief, I think. Yeah. At the time. So did you have, I don't know a lot about borderline personality disorder, but is there usually an onset after um, pregnancy or do you think it was something that you've had um, but the pregnancy and childbirth just like exacerbated it. Yeah. Um, when they, when I read through the symptoms afterwards, mm -hmm. it did explain a lot of stuff in my life. Yeah. Um, and I, it was quite nice to have something cause I always knew I was quite, I was different. I always felt different, but yeah. I knew my behavior, it was normal for me, but it wasn't normal behavior for everyone else. So to have something that actually explained why I do things the way I do or, past childhood experiences or the way I was raised kind of contributed to that was quite a big you know revelation um and it was such a yeah such a relief to have it so I think I mean now I'm the woman I am um, because I since I 
been in the mental health system in the UK, there's quite a big stigma surrounding it. Um, yeah. It's usually a diagnosis that get, get, gets given when there's nothing else to be left to be diagnosed or they can't explain someone's behaviour. So they kind of put you in this box and say, like, this is what's wrong with you. I know a lot of people don't agree with it, but I had um, a consultant that actually empowered me to take my diagnosis and move forward with it. And since then, I've just been, I guess, trying to empower other people. Um, mm -hmm. maybe it's not really you, it's just a diagnosis. You know, you can take certain things from it and build upon it and change your life, basically. Yeah. Has it affected your parenting or um, your partnership at all with your husband? Do you think? Um, it's definitely affected my relationship 100%. Yeah. I, I think with the OCD and liking things in certain ways, also the mood swings, that is quite difficult for someone else to deal with. Um, I mean, the slight, I mean, he, he said to me once, he never knows who he's going to come home to. So <laughs> it's not really such a nice thing for me, but it's, it yeah. can be quite true. Like, he just doesn't know, you know, if I'm going to be angry, I'm going to be sad, I'm going to be really happy. It's just, it's just mm -hmm. what I um, sometimes he says he's treading on eggshells around me, but it's always like a work in progress. I'm always trying to find ways to understand myself or ways to improve things. So it's been both it's triggers or something or how you can avoid mood swings. Can you do that? Um, I guess with medication that might help. And I guess avoiding triggers, knowing what will set you off, um, knowing situations you don't want to be in removing mm -hmm. yourself from situations. Um, alcohol can be a big one, so staying away from that as well. I think just avoid things that make you uncomfortable. Yeah. Those things, yeah. Um, that's really interesting because with something like obsessive compulsive disorder, um, avoidance is really not helpful. <laughs> like, mm. um, it can it just contributes to the obsessive compulsive cycle but it just like brings to mind why having the proper diagnosis matters because the treatments and the coping skills are gonna be so different. Yeah, I guess it's about knowing your limits as well. Mm -hmm. If you, you, can, you can't avoid certain things forever, but yeah. you can go and do them. And then, you know, once you know you've had enough is to make sure you leave then rather than stay. But some people feel like they have to stay to please others. So it's such a fine balance really getting everything right and then not being able to ruminate over it afterwards. So it's, I mean, I think every situation you're ever in, there's always something to learn from it afterwards and always something to make sure, like, next time I'm not going to do this or certain ways to behave, I think. Mm -hmm. So since this is a show about the intersectionality between parenthood and mental health, um, I wanted to ask you, what mental health condition do you think has been the most challenging in terms of being a mom? I would say definitely postnatal depression because we struggle to bond. Well, I I had issues, I don't think Jake did. Um, so that didn't come till quite late on. Um, mm -hmm. Most recently, I think it's definitely eating disorders that can be quite compulsive and impulsive and very strong um, and it does affect meal times the type yeah. of food we have in the house um routines as well so and as he's getting older he's going to pick up on these kind of things which then leads into the guilt about how i am as well um so i think at the minute it's definitely an eating disorder yeah how long have you had an eating disorder um, so since I was 12 and I was quite severely ill at 15, was given two weeks to live. Um, and then it's kind of been on and off maybe throughout my teenage years, throughout my twenties. Um, and quite recently it's resurfaced again. So I don't think it ever really goes away. It's just in times of maybe stress. And I think lockdown has been quite difficult for me. Um, not being able to leave the house very much. <laughs> I think lockdown has been really hard for everybody. It's like it's caused a resurgence of symptoms and all kinds of mental health disorders, mm -hmm. and especially even people who have really no experience with feeling like out of control or 
nervous, I think it's been really hard for them too. As far as your eating disorders go, have what have been your tactics for managing that? So I have, you well, usually <laughs> pre-COVID, I had quite a good support system in place, but that's all kind of stopped for the time being. So I think that's why it's maybe, it, it, that has been the thing I can control um, yeah. as a mechanism as well. Um, so usually I do have a good mental health team, which I have access to. I usually had therapy two, three times a week. Um, so that was quite good. But now it's all done virtually, which I do find a lot more difficult maybe to talk about certain problems and like we were talking about before is just registering people's facial expressions and things like that is mm -hmm. quite exhausting. I think so too because even virtually like you can only see someone's face whereas if you were in session your therapist could maybe notice if your foot was moving more or you were like wringing your hands or there'd be a lot more to go off of. Yeah, definitely. And then, like we said before, you like always reading the non-verbal cues, the body language you can't see, the body language you can see, people mm -hmm. lips moving, you know, and if you miss certain words because the connection cuts out, it's just like afterwards, you're like, oh, God, that was just, but, you know, you just run a marathon or something because your brain yeah. is trying to do all these things at once. For sure. So how many virtual sessions do you have a week? Um, at the moment, it's three. And then it's usually two hours long as well. Go ahead. So they're usually two hours long as well. Is it with all different members of your team or just one person? Um, there's usually two facilitators, which are the mental health professionals. Um, and then it's the rest of the group, which I guess are the patients. <laughs> oh, that's really good. Yeah. It sounds like you have a lot of support. What role, does your husband play a pretty big role in that? Um. He is there to talk to. Um, he is good at quite challenging certain behaviours as well. Usually I, I challenge them back, so it can be quite difficult. <laughs> <laughs> but he is, no, he's he's a great support, actually. Yeah, he, he puts up with a lot. <laughs> and he doesn't really ever complain. I sometimes wonder how, like, how men can, or how well they handle really hard situations like this. Like... I'm sure having a baby isn't easy for them. And then also when their partner, like you or I, experiences such um, like hard and debilitating symptoms afterwards, I'm, like, I'm always really thankful that not everyone ends up with a great partner, obviously, but I'm always really thankful at how well my husband has been able to cope. And it seems like your husband does a pretty good job too. Yeah, especially when we lost the baby and he carried on going to work and they supporting us both and he never you know every time I was a crying mess he was always scooped me up and put me back together um and then once we, I was admitted to the mother and baby unit he was there every single night after work there for Jake's bedtime always constantly ringing up checking on how we were sort of thing so he's he's taken it all in his stride and I'm not quite sure how he does it yeah um, is quite incredible. Well, hats off to him. Yes. Um, <laughs> how long were you in the mother and baby unit? Um, four months in total, which felt more like eight months actually, but yeah. yeah. Four months. And then was the transition to being in the mother and baby unit to going home an easy one? No, not at all. So I was quite regularly um, on a one-to-one, -one, which means you have someone with you at all times. And due to your own safety. So I came off that a week later, I was allowed to go home. Two weeks later after that, I was discharged. So it was quite a fast progression for having someone there 24 seven to learn yeah. being in the house, which you'd not been in for months. And the last time you were there, you had all these memories of like, how awful it was. So it was a lot to deal with, I think. Um, and I was basically, coming home with an eight month old newborn, that's how it felt. And I, we were starting to get to know each other. Um, yeah. We bonded by that point. And I just, it was two months before I went back to work. So I just felt like I had all this time, like all these eight months to make up for and cram it into these two months. So looking back, it was quite stressful. Um, I mean, but... two months is not a long time. <laughs> yeah, so looking back, I think I should have taken a lot longer off work, but there was that pressure. 
I guess, to have the income, um, to go back to your job, to keep mm -hmm. your job open. It's just, it was a lot to take in and from go, especially when you've had, you know, your whole maternity leave is just either been in the depths of depression or in hospital or just fighting yeah. something or it, it just wasn't your standard maternity leave. Um, so it was going back to where it was quite a struggle as well. Are you still working? At the minute, I'm not, no. Um, <laughs> I am off sick due to my mental health. Mm -hmm. How how long do they give you for sick leave? Just wondering. Um, I think it quite varies quite a bit in the UK, I guess, because we are covered usually by a company kind of sick programme where you still get paid. Um, mm -hmm. And then you go off a government kind of sick pay kind of thing. Um, and after that, you don't get anything, but you still are able to retain your job unless the company has to go down like a court kind of route to get rid of you. So there is quite a lot of things that protect you if you're mentally ill, which I'm yeah. quite grateful for, actually. That sounds really good. That sounds like you have a lot of, like, your bases covered. Um, do you ever feel... Since you just said for the mentally ill, I know that lots of people don't like the term mentally ill. How do you feel about it? Um, I guess I've had such positive experiences in my life that I don't think it is debilitating. Mm -hmm. And it's becoming more and more widespread and more talked about and the wider conversation, there's less stigma. That yeah. It's as normal as breaking your leg. That's how it feels to me. And I'm, think, and I'm now in a position where I don't feel afraid to talk about it. Whereas I know you want to hide it. Yeah, and I feel like hiding it makes it so much worse because you're kind of reinforcing the stigma that's put on it and yeah. like feelings of shame. Oh, definitely. Yeah. There is a law in the UK now that every workplace must have a mental health first aider. So it's the same as a physical first aider. So if someone's there. Great. I don't think we have that here. You do have it? Or? No, I mean, no. I would love that. That, I mean, I think it should be everywhere, like worldwide. So, I mean, it's great because that, that person's job is to spot people who are anxious, depressed, that have mental illness, might help them um, to adjust at work, might put reasonable adjustments in and things like that. So it's it, it's a fabulous law. It's been, I think it's been a long time coming, really. Yeah, that sounds really great. So since you've been home um, for your mental health, do you feel like you've been um, managing it better? Like, where are you right now, do you think, in your recovery? Um, in terms of my postnatal depression, I'm completely recovered. Mm -hmm. I don't have any issues like that at all. Um, we, me and Jake have such a fabulous blunt, blunt, sorry, bond now. Yeah. Um, in terms of the borderline personality disorder, I think that's quite well managed. I don't have a lot of, it is quite self-harm. I don't have any issues like that. Um, PMDD is obviously very monthly. Yeah. So um, the eating disorder isn't is quite primarily active right now. So that's the main thing I struggle with. And you're at your mom's right now. Yes, I am. <laughs> that's so nice. How are, are they like really open about talking about mental health too? Oh yeah, me and my mom are so honest. I think that's been a great relationship that's been nurtured over the years. And um, my dad isn't so good at talking about it, but I think that's a generational thing. Yeah. Um, he was in the army as well. So he, no, obviously no one talks about their mental health in the army, but that is something that's hopefully changing as well. Yeah, I feel like those kinds of jobs, like even in um, like jobs where they have like high trauma and mm -hmm. lots of things <laughs> kind of really need to be able to compartmentalize to do your job well. I think they don't have a really strong culture in talking about their feelings. No, and because it's primarily men, and a lot of men are taught never to speak or not to cry, or they think you know, mental health is for the weak, that kind of thing. Yeah. So that's something that's changing as well. Okay, let's see, I have, we just have a little... <laughs> I have lots of technical difficulties here. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask, I think we covered everything that I wanted to talk about. And thank you. You've been so 
honest and vulnerable and, and answering so many of the questions that I've had. Um, what, what advice would you give to any women who, well, I, I wanted to know what advice you would have to give to women who have bipolar disorder, not bipolar, I mean, sorry, wrong set, borderline personality disorder and, or maybe an eating disorder or some other type of mental health condition and they want to have children, but they might be too afraid of managing it all. I think that no mental illness can stop you from having children. I think it's very useful to be prepared to mm -hmm. research where you might go for help, to put a plan in place, especially a postpartum mental health plan, which is obviously my baby at the minute, um, yeah. just to have help and support on hand, what you do in a crisis, plan ways of coping, um, not to be ashamed about anything to do with mental health because we, we all suffer in one way or another. Um, and having a mental illness and being a mother, you can still do the both at all, at both together. Um, yeah. It's not one or the other. And it's, you know, it's, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be a long road. But I think, you know, with a bit more effort and preparation, it can be done. So, yeah. I love that. I also saw on your post recently, you posted about having a maternal health, maternal mental health plan put in place for after giving birth. Yeah. Can you share, can you tell me about that? It's basically like a support plan of, I guess, things you might do. Um, it's kind of, well, it depends on if you have other children, whether mm -hmm. you know, they have, you have, or you have family close by, just about preparing meals maybe in advance or asking family members to do that, or seeing if the child can go to like a daycare, um, making a list of coping mechanisms. Um, if we just ask people to have a look, because I can't remember off the top of my head. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, I can have a quick look, hang on. Okay. <laughs> um, so we have a parental mental health service in the UK. So if you haven't been referred, just to ask your GP if you can be. Um, having a safety net in place, which involves friends and family, talking mm -hmm. to people about your mental health, things you're worried about, um, access to therapy, which can be very beneficial because it can, motherhood can some like quite difficult childhood experiences. And then when you're yeah. becoming a mother at the same time, all these things happen and there's flashbacks and that can all like come to the forefront of your head and it can be quite difficult to deal with. Um, peer support, which is a big one. So if you know enough that's been through, this before, you know, you can talk to them, go into groups in, in, I don't know, in local areas, there might be specific groups for mothers with mental health conditions, but you don't know about them until you start looking. Um, yeah. Finding a play group that you're comfortable with, um, just to take your babies with, that you can go to, you start to meet new people at the same time. Um, discuss the nursery one. I think going back to work as well, because I think some mothers um, lose their identity a little bit and they think oh you know this is I'm just gonna be a mom for the rest of my life so mm -hmm. having planning a time and a space when you're going to go back to work or if you don't want to go back to the work that's absolutely fine but I think yeah. having a goal to aim for on the horizon can be quite beneficial as well um, it helps the stability yeah. yeah and especially because there's either like there's so much pressure to be a mom and for it to be like the only thing, you know, you must be a mom, you're, you have a child now and this should be great for you. But so many moms have, I mean, we all have identities outside of being moms, you know, and if going back to work is something that fuels you and energizes you and gives you some part of yourself back, then I think totally go for it. Like my mom went back to work after six weeks Oh, wow. <laughs> because she just really wanted to. And I don't think she's ever regretted it. And me, I, I just didn't want to go back to work. But now, because I wasn't ready, but now, like, my youngest is three. And I'm like, okay, I'm ready to <coughs> now. Like, some people take longer than others. Some people just adapt differently. It's what's mm -hmm. ever for you, I think. And don't feel pressure from the people to make a decision about how they feel in their opinion as well. Um, another one I did put was incorporating rest into your schedule, which is not easy with a newborn. Oh, yeah. um, it's about, I guess, taking the time out to put your phone down, um, to try and have a bath, 
um, or you know making sure your partner you, when they come home will have an hour to yourself and um, discussing times you can get alone maybe reading